Okay, well, we're moving right along. <laughs> I'm gonna move a little faster. Uh, patents, this is kind of my area of expertise. Uh, the patent grants you the right to exclude others from making, using, and selling your invention in exchange for teaching it to the public. So it's a type of monopoly. We give you a gift of a certain period of time. You can prevent others from making and using and selling your invention. The key important part here is it doesn't give you the right to practice that invention. It gives you a right to exclude others. It doesn't give you freedom to operate. Um, has a year, uh, has a life of 20 years from the filing date. And this is the regular filing date. And we'll talk about that next. Um, and it's enforceable once issued. So just because you filed it, I keep getting people, but I filed it and it's like, but it hasn't issued. So um, really quick on the whole right to exclude, because I think it's important. It's something people don't understand. Uh, let's say someone gets a, a, a patent on a donut and your patent is on a glazed donut. Doesn't give you the right to make, use and sell a glazed donut because someone else had a patent before you on a donut. So you know, it's sort of the concept about what it allows. It can, pre you can prevent others. The first donut guy can't do your glazed donut, but then you can't do a donut. Um, so it's something that people don't catch um, that often when they understand, when they're trying to understand what rights they get when they do get an issued patent. Agreements are another form of protection of your IP. This is, goes, goes back to you want to disclose early. Um, you want to disclose your invention and get something filed before there's a disclosure. The, the one thing that can, that can be done, I, I'm not I'm a fan of it myself, I still like to file first, but if you get someone to sign a non-disclosure agreement, um, that still protects you from that disclosure and you can still you know, file your patent application. But in general, you, you know, even after you filed, you want to get these agreements in place. It kind of you know, shows what you guys talked about in case there's some sort of you know, filing later. <laughs> so what do you do when you have a new invention or software? Please disclose it to our office as soon as possible. Um, you lose rights around the world. You know, there's some exceptions in the US for filing after a disclosure. Um, but you lose rights to the rest of the world if you've disclosed your invention. So um, there's a lot of, you know, but ifs and what kind of, was it, is it, is it really a disclosure? Um, it's good to talk to our office about it though beforehand. Um, again, that's our website and uh, our website also has information about filing a disclosure and contact anyone in our office if you have a question about that. So how do we decide what inventions to patent um, or file patent applications on? As you can see, there's a number. <laughs> there's a number of things that we would love to know the answers to before we file. Sometimes it's like, hey, I'm gonna do an disclosure next week. We don't have a lot of time to answer a lot of these questions. One of the bigger ones for us is, is it a method or is it a thing? You know, is it, is it a compound or is it a method of making? Then we ask this because how easy is it going to be to enforce a patent that the only way you can figure out how someone's making it is to sneak into, into their you know, offices and figure out how they're making it. It's not going to be easy. So, but if you're filing on a compound versus a method of making it, uh, a lot easier because when you buy that compound, you'll be able to distinguish whether you know, it's covered by your patent or not. There's a lot of other things. Um, how unique is it? Um, you know, cost benefit analysis. Does it work? Does is it safe? Um, again, do we have exclusive rights or are we joint owners with somebody? So there's a number of issues that we look at. Um, what can be patented? Uh, less and less each year. <laughs> the U.S. courts are making it more and more difficult. Uh, but essentially. It used to be anything under the sun modified by man, um, but uh, it, it, the key things are that it's novel, uh, not obvious, and it's useful. It also needs to um, enable the public to make it because once it goes off and you know, after that term is expired, people have to be able to make it. So there, 
definitely looking at whether you're teaching somebody in of ordinary skills how to make and use the invention. And this is the crazy patent process and timeline, but to speed it up, um, typically at the very on the top top left, you, you have the invention disclosure. We decide to file, we file a US provisional application. They run anywhere from five to ten thousand dollars, maybe sometimes a little less. Within 12 months, you know, um, so that's not examined, that patent examined, that never turns into an issued patent. But 12 months later, we have to make the next decision. Do we file a PCT? Do we file a regular US or, or do we just drop it? Has any company come to us expressing an interest? If not, that, you know, we might just drop it. But if we think it's a hot, you know, a, a hot technology and hot area, we may just file a PCT. And again, um, and then 18 months from the original priority date, uh, there's a publication. And then 30 months from that earliest priority date, that's when that provisional was filed, you, you file nationally. And this is, these are the patent applications that actually get examined by the patent office. Um, I won't go into the PCT because it never issues, but the national filings is when it gets really expensive. You have to do translations and you can see um, below uh, the totals for like US filing anywhere from 30 to 50,000, Europe 40 to 50, Japan 50. So it, it can be very expensive. Usually it's, um, these are again, patent fees. These are law firms fees for their time. These are translations. So again, patent, patents can be very expensive. Um, so when you file nationally, these are the ones that are examined. These are the ones that issue. And there's maintenance fees and annuity fees. So um, again, patents are expensive. And these are the things that as a startup, um, you'd be interested in. How do we license from the university? Well, there's um, licenses are, we call, that's the big time. That's when you've got to have some money. You've got to have a commercialization plan. So a lot of companies, we don't start with agreements like licenses with startups. Oftentimes we do these short-term letter agreements. They're for six months. Sometimes they're extended. Generally are about $500. We use that fee to pay towards the patent expenses, which are much more than $500. Um, but it's sort of a, that give, give the company a break. Give you new time to go to a VC or your mom and someone to give you money for your company. Um, and again, we often extend these, but then sometimes companies come to us and say, well, we've talked to a VC and they really want us to be in something more robust um, uh, than this one page, one to two page simple agreement. We want an option agreement. Um, we don't make companies, by the way, go into any, you know, you come to us with a commercialization plan, you've got some money to pay for the um, upfront fees and a number of other fees that you'll pay eventually, like patent costs, you can go right into a license agreement. Um, so there's no step process. And I've had companies that were in license agreements go back and say, yeah, I can't afford all these fees. Can we go into an option agreement again? So, uh, but typically we do letter agreements and companies either do an option after or, or license. And we have all these templates on our website, if you're curious. There's uh, people often ask, what are the fees? Um, we don't know. We don't know what the fees are. We get our fees, our fees on the license particularly, we get from comparables. So we, we need to see a plan from you. What is your licensed product gonna be like? What's your company? Um, tell, describe, describe your company, describe your finances, describe what you expect to be, you know, when are you gonna be profitable? It's sort of the same information a VC would ask, but way less. Um, but has maybe it's a smaller scale of the information that a VC would. So licensing strategy. So this, so this is something again. This is a company needs to answer some questions. Um, what's going to work for the company? Is it something that you need an exclusive license for versus a non-exclusive? Maybe the IP is really only a tool. Um, that's going to get you there. It's not something that is foundational uh, necessarily. Um, 
exclusivity is very typical for therapeutic applications and diagnostic applications where you have to spend a lot of R&D money and a lot of time to get there. So you don't, you know, you need to create that moat around that IP. Um, again, significant investment required to reach the market. You're probably going to want exclusivity. Um, is it, you know, super early stage technology? Um, you know, maybe you don't need non, uh, an exclusive. Um, you're certainly going to pay more, obviously, for, for an exclusive license. And then, you know, we're looking at this too. It's not just the company dictates it. It's like we're trying to work with the company um, to decide what makes the most sense. Uh, we can have an exclusive license, have a separate field of use, a uh, limited field of use where we can do multiple exclusive licenses. Um, it's another way to, you know, share patent costs uh, amongst other licensees. And if it's something that you're not interested in, you know, it doesn't hurt the company. Uh, territories, geographies, uh, each patent, there's no such thing as a worldwide patent. A PC, some people think PCT application is a worldwide patent. It isn't. And then um, you have to look at whether you want it, again, limited or worldwide. You know, do you only need to make, use, and sell in a particular country, or um, do you need worldwide? Typically, our licenses are worldwide. 